And it's BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. My guest on the program today is Mike Rodelli. He is the author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, The Hunt for Zodiac, and he is one of the groundbreaking researchers in the Zodiac Killer mystery. And he's also working on a new book about the monster of Florence, so he has a lot of observations about true crime cases that he is going to share with us. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing just fine. So just in case somebody is not familiar with your work, would you like to give us a brief introduction on how you came about researching the Zodiac Killer mystery and the suspect that you landed on? Sure. Well, it's hard for me to believe that there are people that don't know who I am. Just kidding. Um, yeah, in 1998, well, 19, 1987, I read Robert Graysmith's book, like everybody else basically did, uh, that get, gets involved in the case. and. Um, it was such an intriguing story that I kept it on my bookshelf, and every couple of years I'd go back to it and reread it and reread it. Uh, the thing that attracted me was, especially, was the just sort of the uh, sterile, cold nature of the the codes, how they were laid out. Even though I'm not a code person and didn't do any work on the on the ciphers themselves, that's sort of what caught my attention. And um, by 1998, I was working at a job where it was sort of a boring job. And uh, when I had a chance, when the boss wasn't looking over my shoulder, because they didn't have the same type of internet monitoring software that they did, they do today, that they back then. So when my boss wasn't actually looking over my shoulder, I would go on the internet and I would look for something interesting to fill the time that the job that I didn't find very interesting. So um, I found some websites related to the Zodiac case. I found a, a Jackson Garland site. I found some chat rooms, message boards, and I started to follow them. I wasn't posting, but I was just reading them. And uh, then <clears throat> at the same time, Dr. Mike Kelleher was doing the research for his book, uh, This is the Zodiac Speaking, which eventually came out. He and David Van Nuys wrote that book in like 2001. But at the time he was doing research on that book and uh, I uh, befriended him and we started talking about uh, Riverside was the most interesting case to me at the time because I thought at the time, I think everybody thought at the time that that was Zodiac's first murder. Now, I don't think it was. And a lot of people, you know, I think also don't feel it was his first murder. Uh, there are people that do feel it was his first murder, but I'm not in that group anymore. But at the time, I, I did. And so I was very interested in Riverside because I viewed it as being like, like the, the time when you could basically develop some information to catch him because he was a novice. He had committed his first murder. And so I was talking to Mike Keller about that. And by uh, June of 1999, I had an idea that was based on something that Mike Kelleher told me because I had written to Mike Kelleher about a week before. And he told me that Zodiac didn't send his first letters until after his second attack. And I thought to myself, I wonder if he could have sent a, a letter to the editor after his after his first attack, but nobody has ever found it and nobody ever thought of looking for it. The first attack was on December 20th, 1968. At the time, before this whole thing with Riverside came up, where they said that some kid wrote the, uh, the base at the die letters, which I don't necessarily believe at this point, but... Um, because uh, because Riverside in their press release did not give any information about how they linked this this kid to the base at the dial letters. I don't think they wanted to give out any information about the base at the dial letters, like whether they had DNA on them or whatever. So they were very sketchy about how they how they linked this kid to the uh, to the letters back in the press release that they released in like 2022, I think, or something like that, or 21 maybe. No, 22, I think. So. Um, um, so I, I viewed Zodiac as having written his first letters exactly six months after the after the Bates murder, because the Bates murder took place in a, in the October of 1966, and he wrote the first letters, the Bates had to die letters, I thought, uh, in uh, 19, 1967, April. So at that point, I was working under the assumption that Zodiac might have written his first letters six months after, after the Lake Herman Road murders. By that point, which would have been June of 1969, uh, Zodiac did not yet exist because he didn't send his letters to the three papers until July. So I thought he might have either written the, the letters under a pseudonym or under his real name. So I had a, a colleague I was working with at the time named Ed, and I, he was living in the Vallejo area, so he had access to all the microfilm and things like that. So I had him go and look at the uh, look at the papers for June of 1969 for a specific time frame for like June uh, let's see, from the, from like the 21st to the to the end of the month or something like that. And uh, he came up with one letter, and the only reason he picked up the letter is that it mentioned Hitler. But when I saw the letter, 
I saw a lot of elements in it that, that could be reflective of the Zodiac case. They were sort of uh, concealed in the letter, like a bloody confrontation and young people lying dead and wounded by the, in the streets and things like that. So uh, when I looked at the name at the bottom of the letter, which was Shell Cavalli, which is a difficult name to say and spell, it's K-J-E-L-L. Q-V-A-L-E, but the last name sounds like Cavalli, like C-A-V-A-L-L-I, like an Italian name, but it's a Norwegian name. Um, I was pretty shocked because I actually knew who Cavalli was from, from being involved in horse racing, and I, I had seen his name in the daily racing form. That did not make me say, well, let's make this guy the Zodiac Killer. It's just that it was eerie that Ed had reached back 30 years at that point from 1999 to 1969. June 26, 69 was the day of the letter. And um, he had found a letter by someone, uh, written by someone that I actually knew who he was. So it was kind of freaky. And we just decided that we would just do some research on Cavalli. We thought we'd quickly rule him out uh, because we found out that he was so wealthy and that we didn't think people, someone like that would be a serial killer. So uh, we started doing research and we started finding things that that were kind of interesting, that he lived near the site of the, uh, the last murder the Zodiac committed within two and a half blocks. Uh, he looked like the he looked like the police sketch. He wrote to me twice on Monarch Size Stationery in the summer of 1969. So uh, it just snowballed from there. And um, I've done a lot of research in the last 25 years, and I believe that Cavalli was the Zodiac killer. Okay, though, but now you have proposed a suspect that has dealt with a lot of criticism from a lot of different angles. And would you like to share any more introductory material, or do you want to jump right into some challenge questions that people have put into the Black Box Online Radio comments section? And sure. What's well, better for I'll you? say this, that any suspect that's developed that isn't the one that's on the main Zodiac message board get heat. Everybody gets heat. Uh, even even Geik, I guess, gets heat. Yes. But um, I people, the, main, the main thing about this, when I first started looking at the Zodiac case, I thought I was very naive. I thought message boards were there for people to talk about the case and for someone to come up with a suspect that made sense and for everybody to jump on the bad wagon and say, this guy must have been a Zodiac. But I found out the opposite is true. When you come out with a suspect, everyone's trying to defend their suspect and they're doing anything they can to destroy your, your work. So uh, it's a very different environment from what I expected. And in fact, I, I post very little on Zodiac message boards today because of that. Uh, I used to post a lot, but not anymore because I know that, I know what I'm up against. I'm up against people who are defending their suspects to the, to the hilt and uh, who are out to get me, basically. So, but you can, they can take their best shots. Let's see what the questions are. But first, I should say that in all fairness, there are quite a few people who regularly contribute in discussions that do not have a suspect, and maybe they're looking at it from a different way. I mean, Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com, Michael Cole also doesn't have a suspect, and even me, Ned DeHaan. So, um, I mean, mm -hmm. looking no, at I'm things... I'm not saying everybody has a suspect, but many people do. And, you know, like there's one guy that says, uh, if Guy gets in the Zodiac, I'll eat my hat. You know, so how am I supposed to convince someone like that 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 Cavalli was Zodiac? You know, it's 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 impossible. But go ahead, I, I'm ready for questions. Now, I'm sure you remember, Mike, on Black Box Online Radio, I did a book discussion about a book that was written about your Zodiac killer suspect called Lunches with Mr. Q. And it mm -hmm. wasn't even necessarily Zodiac related. I was just discussing this book that's been written by Kevin Nelson about your suspect, whom, as you said, was involved in many aspects of um, the financial world. He was a businessman. Can we call him an auto tycoon? Is that fair? Definitely. Yeah, um, auto tycoon. I would call him a... Yeah, uh, auto tycoon. Um, I'm trying to think of the word I want. I can't think of the word, but he was Executive, a. Um, he was an entrepreneur. He was an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. So, but that's what lunches with Mr. Q is all about. And I just did a book discussion for the uh, Friday segment, which the anything goes Friday at the time. And somebody just without any context wrote in saying, "But wasn't he too old?" Now your suspect was 50 years old at the time, correct? Of the Zodiac murders, and I mean. Right. I know that that's a simple question, but that comes up all the time with Shel Cavale. Some people think that that's outside of the witness descriptions, outside of the um, voice that people heard, outside of the um, certain aspects of profiling. I know you get into that a lot, but what's your response to that? Let's just get this one out of the way. Sure. Um, there's a difference between how old you are and how old you look. And throughout his whole life, in, in articles that I've read about, about him, you know, they're totally unrelated to the Zodiac case. They talk about the fact that he always looked younger than his years. So when you look out the window and you see somebody, you don't see what their age is, what their age is on the birth certificate. You see how they look. 
And to say that he was 50, but it would have looked 35 to 45 in uh, 1969 is certainly in keeping with uh, with what I know about him. So I don't I don't give any credence to the people that say he was too old. As far as being too old to start killing people, I had a professional profiler work on the case, and he had no problems with, with Cavalli as a suspect. He never brought up the age. In fact, he said that it's possible, and, and I've never been able to prove this, but I'm just putting it out there, that he could have started killing earlier than, than when he was the Zodiac, but we just never found out about it. But as far as uh, you know, him not resembling the sketch or the description, 35 to 45, whatever, that means nothing to me because uh, he always looked younger than he was. In fact, when he was in his 90s, I think they talked about him being spry and and you know always looking younger than than his than his actual years. Okay, so firstly, um, as someone who runs a true crime channel like me, I've definitely encountered serial killers who start killing later on in life. Charles Albright, the eyeball killer, was in his late 50s. Allegedly, he was 57 at the time of his first murder, and I have suspicions the same way that Mike said about his Zodiac suspect. Could he have started committing crimes like in murders well before right, that? Albright might have also. Yeah. You're right. Albright right. might have I mean, been earlier too, so possible i mean but i mean that's just something that comes up but here's something that's a little bit more challenging now mike mm -hmm. i do have to thank you of course because you've authored a couple episodes of black box online radio which i invite people to go and find one of them was called zodiac shell cavale ama you wrote out a very big section for that and then i also read off some objections that people had giving a shout out to youtube user jamie hendrickson who said shell cavale was an extremely successful businessman millionaire and we don't see cases of high profile, highly successful, financially successful individuals committing serial murders like this. What's your response to that? My response to that is maybe that's why the case has gone unsolved for 50 years. I mean, uh, you know, Zodiac was, pro was he doesn't seem to have been someone who was inside the box. He seemed to be outside the box. And um, I had an interesting discussion with uh, Richard Walter, the profiler I worked with. Um, when I talked to him about, uh, we were talking about Trump, and uh, he said, he said that Cavalli and Trump are basically both power assertive people. They're both basically the same profile. And when they got to a certain point in their lives where they were still seeking power, there was a there was a bifurcation. Trump went into politics in order to accrue power, and the other choice is to go into murdering people for power, which is what Cavalli did. And uh, Trump gave sort of a little hint to this uh, to this second path when he said that he could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue and get away with it. Uh, that's sort of the attitude I think that Cavalli had. Uh, people say, well, he wouldn't have killed in his own neighborhood. He was too well known. Cavalli, they just don't understand this man. He was very aloof. I mean, I think even the people a couple of doors down from him might not have known who he was because he didn't associate with people. He only associated with people that he chose to associate with. And um, I think that he felt that he had planned out the Presidio Heights murder so well that I think the way it was originally planned out, well, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm diverting from your question, so I won't say that, but uh, I, I think that, uh, is it right if I divert? Yeah. Yes, please, okay. I want to say it's all yours. Right. I think the City of Heights murder, the thing is here, here here's the thing, I've, I've been able to provide people with a suspect that actually lived at Presidio Heights. That's, that's the toughest murder for people to figure out because it's such an obscure area of San Francisco. How did Arthur Lee Allen know it? How did Geick know it? How did Larry Kane know it? Um, if you actually lived there, that would explain how you would know. And if you walked a dog every night, you were basically casing the neighborhood every night. Now, he said he only walked a dog twice in his life when I spoke to him personally in 2006. You don't necessarily believe that. But that's what he said. He said a lot of things that weren't true that day, and that might be one of them. But uh, if, if you're walking around the neighborhood every night at 10 o'clock and you see how desolate it is and you get to know a certain corner in the neighborhood, and I've gone into this very extensively in my book about why I think this corner was chosen because of line of sight uh, issues with some of the houses, he would have basically eliminated two of the houses immediately. I think if, if he had if he had killed Stein at Washington and Maple, he would have eliminated the house on that on the north on the uh, northeast corner and the house on the northwest corner because they didn't have lines of sight to the to the murder, even though the murder was occurring right outside the house on the northeast corner. That part of the house was recessed about 50 feet and there are the trees, I think, intervening. So he would have been able to eliminate two houses. The only the only two houses he would have to worry about was the one across the street, which is where uh, a person had died, and only, the only people living there were the help. And maybe he felt that he was so superior to the help he didn't have to worry about them, or maybe they were worrying. Maybe they were living in the uh, in the help 
help part of the house, which was on Maple Street, which wouldn't have had a good line of sight to the murder scene. I don't know when he walked by every night, maybe he didn't see lights on in the main part of the house. I'm not sure how that worked out because I wasn't there. But the only house I really had to worry about would have been the house on the on the southwest corner of Washington Maple. So that's one out of three houses. So I think that he planned to kill Stein so quickly and get out of the cab so quickly and then then basically run down the hill because he Cavalli was an ex-sprinter in uh, in uh, college and high in high school and college. And I think he was planning to kill Stein, get out of the cab so quickly, run down the hill and then go to his house, which is right around the corner, that nobody would have even known Stein was dead by the time he got home. But of course, it didn't work out that way. He ended up at the next corner and the rest is history. Um, but um, but I think that people that are that are wealthy can commit crimes. Um, you know, there's no law that says that they can't. And Richard Walter gave the reason why they did. Basically, they get to that bifurcation point and one has to choose which way to get power, either murder people for power or go into politics for power. And I think Cavalli chose the sec the first path, which was murdering people for power. OK, now this is something that someone once shared with me about, um, oh, let's see, maybe a year and a half ago. I did a book discussion once on your copy of The Hunt for Zodiac. And by my own mistake, I posted a photo on Black Box Online Radio of Shel Cavalli, and you corrected me by saying that that's not Shel that's, Cavalli, that's, that's actually his brother Canute. I mean, something that was just on Google Images. It was mislabeled on Google Images. And somebody wrote to me and they said, Ned, I think you were onto something unintentionally. Is there any possibility that Canute Cavale could have been the Zodiac, that all of Micro Deli's things are working out? It's just Canute Cavale seemed to resemble the composite sketch a little bit more, the hairline, the jawline, and I don't even know what to make of that, so I'm going to pass that one on to you. Well, I, I like the questions where people say, is it possible? Because anything is possible, you know, but I think that I didn't do, a, I mean, I did research on Canute, but I don't think he was living in San Francisco. I think he was living in, in Los Angeles. And uh, obviously with all the letters that were sent, uh, you know, Canute would have had to spend a lot of time in, in San Francisco mailing all these letters at different times. So, um, I mean, it, it's possible, but I think that, I mean, you know, the dates of the murders, they would fit, obviously, obviously they would fit Shell or Canute, you know, the date the mother died, the date the father was born. The one date that's interesting is July 5th, July 4th to 5th, because the, the caretaker, July, on July 5th, 1947, Cavalli reported flying saucers over Auburn, and he was able to get publicity in uh, two newspapers, one in Alameda and the San Francisco Examiner for his sighting. And, um, you know, this is, to me, this is very Zodiac-like, getting getting publicity from doing something, you know, out of the norm and getting publicity for it. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, well, we were talking about why Canute is not um, the Zodiac. Right, 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 right. Okay. So Blue Rock Springs happened just after midnight on July 5th. So even though Zodiac refers to it as July 4th, it was actually July 5th. And that was the date of Cavalli's flying saucer sighting, not Newt's flying saucer sighting. So I think that if I were to go through all the evidence, um, you know, I think that uh, there's a stronger case to be made for Shell than Canute. I mean, I had to, I'd have to go through it. I haven't really done it to, to, to say anything about Canute, but I think I think Canute lived in Los Angeles, and uh, I don't know that he had, you know, a lot of the time that he spent in San Francisco. I mean, he could have flown up every, you know, for the murders, I guess, and he could have stayed at Shell's house. I remember somebody several years ago was saying that they had figured out the case and whoever it was Zodiac was, he was staying, Shel Cavalli was letting him stay at his house or let him stay in his basement or something, but they had no proof of that. I mean, there's what what evidence other than resemblance of the sketch, I'd like to ask the person that thinks that Canute might've been the Zodiac, let him present a circumstantial case that says that Canute was Zodiac. I've already done it for Shell. Let him tell me why I should think that Canute was Zodiac, not just the resemblance of the sketch, because a lot of people could resemble the sketch. Um, uh, now, wait a second. I would turn to a guy named Mike Rodelli who wrote a fascinating book called In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, the ebook version, The Hunt for Zodiac. And you point out, though, that a lot of dates in Zodiac chronology match up to things that are relevant to Shel Cavale's life that in turn right. would be related to his other brothers. Now, first, in case someone is not familiar with that, would you like to walk us through that? Because that relates to his parents as well as a certain sister city in Norway. Would you like to give us the nutshell version of that stuff right now? Well, I don't have all the dates memorized, but I mean, you know, I used to, but I don't have them anymore. Um, 
I mean, I have my book here, so I can refer to it. Uh, and the Lake Herman Road murders. Uh, uh, first of all, Zodiac thought that they obviously thought that they took place in Vallejo because when he wrote the letters, he talked about Vallejo. He didn't talk about Benicia or Solano County. And uh, there happened to be a sister city, and this was something that blew my mind because uh, I didn't I didn't even realize until someone told me that on the same date that the Jensen Faraday murders were announced, to the left of that, there's an article about sister cities, and I didn't even I didn't even read it. I didn't know anything about it until someone told me about it. It turns out that Vallejo, over the years, has developed sister city relationships with different with different cities. But at the time of the murders at Lake Herman Road, they only had a sister city relationship with one city, and that was Trondheim, Norway, where Cavalli was born. So I think that this is another clue that Zodiac was leaving. Plus that night, um, early in the evening, the William Crow incident, where he was he was driving, he, he told my friend Jim Dean and somebody else, and maybe Lyndon Lafferty, I think it was, years ago, that he had been driving a British sports car that night, either an MG or a Triumph. And then we had Zodiac chasing that car. So I think that uh, you know it's possible that Zodiac may have zeroed in on a, on a, on a car that he could have possibly have sold because the... The girlfriend that bought the car, the girlfriend has never spoken to anybody. We never know who she was. We've never been given her identity. William Crow has been a very uncooperative witness. I've tried to get him to get to speak to him several times. He's promised to help me, but then he just backed out, you know. So uh, I never got to hear from him who the girlfriend was, but she was apparently from, um, she was from um, Napa, I think, but she was living in San Francisco at the time. So did she buy the car in Napa? Where she lived, or did she buy the car in San Francisco, which would almost definitely make it a car from Cavalli's dealership, because he was the biggest British import car dealer in San Francisco at the time. So the, the British, the British car in the chase is very interesting to me, and also the uh, you know the sister city relationship between Vallejo and Trondheim would also could have, could have also been a clue to uh, you know to Cavalli's identity. He was leaving that night by killing at that site. Plus. Uh, when you go to if anyone's ever been to Lake Herman Road, when you look south, basically all you can see because of the way the terrain is set up is Mount Diablo, and I think Mount Diablo plays a you know played a big role with the with the Mount Diablo letter, but also in Cavalli's life because in nineteen and I'm sorry in two thousand five he put out an autobiography and on page sixty six he shows a picture of a of a hill climb auto race for MGs that he sponsored at the very early time of his uh, dealership I think nineteen forty nine, but he doesn't give you the date of the of the of the event, and I said to myself, I wonder if it was June 26th. And it took years and years and years. I mean, I didn't, I didn't go out this tooth and nail to find it, but I've always been curious about what the date was of that race. And uh, through someone that contacted me through my website, uh, someone who had read my book, he was able to steer me to the San Francisco Chronicle for July, let's see, 26th or something. I think July 3rd. And they talked about this hill climbing event, hill climb event, as having happened a week before, and a week before. Uh, July 3rd would have been June 26th. So that means that Cavalli associated himself with Mount Diablo on June 26, 1949, and then Zodiac associated himself with Mount Diablo on June 26, 1970. These dates are exactly the same except for the years. And I think that that's, you know, people say, oh, it's synchronicity or it's a coincidence. There's so many dates that involve Cavalli and the, the Zodiac case that I, I, I think that that's evidence. I don't think that's a, that's a coincidence. Now, if you want me to get into more dates, I'd have to look at my book. Um, right, I was about to say, I recall from reading your book um, that one of the dates lines up to the birth date of one of his parents, and one of the dates lines up to the death date of one of his parents. Is that right? Right, right. Uh, the first murders occurred on December 20th, 1968, and Cavalli's mother died on December 20th, 1939. The late Berryessa crimes occurred on September 27th, 1969, and, and his father was born on November, on, did I say it's November, it was September 27th, 1969 for the for the murders, and September 27th, 19, I mean, 1887 for the birth of his father. Plus, when I went out to meet Cavalli for the meeting that we had in 2006, he initially asked that we would meet on September 22nd, which was a Friday. And then he, then his secretary called me and said he'll be out of town for the weekend, which wasn't true, by the way. He wasn't, he was in town because he gave a lecture uh, he was on a panel at uh, Golden Gate Fields the next day on Saturday, so he was in town. I didn't go to see the lecture, but I wish I had at this point, but I didn't out of respect for him because I didn't want him to see me in the crowd and think, you know, what is this guy doing here and all that. So I just, I just didn't go. Um, but he, so they ended up asking to move the, the meeting to the next Wednesday, and it took me a while to realize that the next Wednesday was September 27th, 2006. So here's the September 27th coming up again, 
And it's almost like, I don't know if he was taunting me or, you know, just uh, making a point or, you know, why he changed the meaning to that date. But here we have three September 27ths appearing in the, in the Zodiac, in the Zodiac lore. Three nines, 27, right? What's that? Nine, ninth month, nine right? So, yeah, nine twenty seven. Because everybody looks at the Zodiac dates and they're trying to make sense of them. And I've tried so hard to rearrange numbers mathematically, but you actually do provide an explanation as to how things could make sense. It's done for a personal reason as opposed to like like turning the compass or some people think that you're supposed right. to like um, add all the, th all the digits together in some type of digital root way, but you provide kind of a different explanation that it's more about his family history, right? Or personal well, reasons. Thing, I actually had, a, not an argument, but I actually had, actually had a discussion with, with Richard Walter because I, I asked him if, if the dates, because the, the dates scattered throughout the calendar, they seem random. But when you look at them through Cavalli's, the prism of Cavalli's eyes, you see that they that they actually have a meaning. Even October 11th, excuse me, going back to um, Zodiac's uh, interest in the in the Bates murder, October 11th was the 10th anniversary. October 11th, 1969 was the 10th anniversary of Cavalli entering his first car in what would become the Riverside Grand Prix. Uh, and the, I'm sorry, it was called the Riverside Grand Prix then. It was then called the LA Times Grand Prix. So it was actually an anniversary on that for that day too. So all the dates actually have an anniversary uh, issued to them and they all reflect back onto, onto Cavalli. Now, what I said to Richard Walter is if, if you plan, like if you sit down with a calendar and you plan to kill people on certain dates, but you're still a serial killer because the, the, the dates are, are the, the dates of the murders are not governed by you satisfying some need on the date and then the needs building up, building up again and then you kill again but they're specifically timed for certain dates because they mean the dates mean something to you they the like i said if if cavalli's mother had died on december 20th and his father was born on september on december 21st and and uh his uh, flying saucer signing occurred on december 22nd and uh, he raced on december 23rd with all the dates have been in a row uh it seems in other words that the 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 dates were random not random but they were they were set so i was wondering if that is really a serial killer because a serial killer you, you you have a cooling off period they say but there really was no if, if if i'm right about the dates there's really no cooling off period it's just that the dates happened to fall where they fell but walter still said that he was a serial killer so i left it at that but i've always wondered about whether he was in a special category of serial killer if he was killing on, spe on special dates that he specifically marked on the calendar for when he would kill Absolutely, because a lot of people use the definition. Someone has to commit three or more murders with like a cooling off period or return to normalcy. And I get what people would say about how, OK, he's going back to his <laughs> daily life and he's going back to working his job and he's kind of assuming normal duties. But what you mean is that if it's all calculated, he's still living out the plan and he's not um, completely putting an end to it. So the it's cooling like off periods are, are not are sort of fake. Because because the dates just happen to be spread out that way. I mean, there's only a two week cooling off period between September 27th and October 11th, and um, you know it wasn't a really long cooling off period for those cooling off periods go. But um, you know, Walter still felt that he was a serial killer, so I left it at that. I didn't want to you know press it any further, but I just thought it was an interesting idea that maybe he wasn't really by definition a serial killer. He was you know killing for completely different reasons for specific dates that he had marked on the calendar and and you know intended to kill on those dates. Uh, regardless of cooling off periods or not. OK, yes, and of course, for everybody in the audience, I've been talking to Mike Rodelli, author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and the Hunt for Zodiac. And if you guys would like to have any other guests on the program, you can put your ideas in the comments section down below. You can also hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And feel free to go through some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. And that website allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. Every Monday is Zodiac Monday here on Black Box online radio. OK, though, Mike, let's talk about something and we can do this rather briefly if you want. But you've let been me just really a second, because when you give the title of my book, you're sort of combining. I, I had a um, an ebook called The Hunt for Zodiac. Yeah. The no oh boy, I'm trying to remember the full title of it, but the, the, the full title of of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo is In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, the shocking true identity of the Zodiac killer. That's that's the full title of that book. You've sort of been combining the two titles. <laughs> the hunt for zodiac the double life of the, i can't remember the word that my, my my publisher wanted to use that word and i did the the uh hold on a second hold i got on. my copy have... here too i mean i'm got like i got mine on kindle so let's race see who can get one first oh he has a bookshelf that's so much faster 
Oh, oh did you, you want get... to go? No, I didn't uh, get it. Now no, I, I blew my whole head start. I thought he was done. Let's see. What is the subtitle of Mike Rodelli's book? Trivia question for anybody in the comments section. Anyone want to join in with this? Let's see. It's got to be here somewhere. I did the book discussion on it, albeit with one or two errors. So many Zodiac books in the library. Got us here. Aha! The inconceivable double life of a notorious serial killer. Conceivable. That's the word my, my publisher wanted to use. She said, since I'm, since I'm publishing the book, I'm using the word inconceivable. So that's the word she wanted to use. So that's the, that's the full title of that book. And then the other one is in the shadow of Mount Diablo, the, sh the shocking true identity of the Zodiac killer. So. Go okay. Yes. But Let's you've been very up. vocal about a particular theory in the Zodiac world. And that is that the Zodiac Killer left the United States of America and then moved to Italy and went on to become a serial killer called the Monster of Florence. This is mostly shared by an individual named Francesco Amiconi, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And this is revolving around a particular suspect named Giuseppe Bevilacqua, also known as Joe Bevilacqua. He was an Italian-American, more or less grew up in America and actually was in the American military. Then he went over, retired in Italy. And when you so Google this Zodiac Monster of Florence connection, I find that you, Mike Rodelli, come to the top of the search results for being critical about it. You wrote a very big piece on your website, and you also said that you're writing a book about the Monster of Florence. And I just want to know, what do you think about all of this? Well, <laughs> excuse me. Having worked with Richard Walter for 14 years, a little bit of profiling obviously rubbed off on me over, over time. And um, I asked him to work with me on the monster of Florence. Uh, he said that he was too busy doing other things to 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 profile the monster. So I, I was sort of left on my own to profile the monster of Florence. But he gave me a little he gave me a clue when he actually got upset when I asked him because uh, he he felt that maybe I wasn't ready to tackle as difficult a case as the monster of Florence. So that basically told me something. And that and that's this. Walter views sexual sadists as like the top of the top of the food chain for serial killers, the most intelligent and the most difficult to catch. So I believe that what he was telling me indirectly by by saying that, you know, he didn't think I was ready to work on a case like that. I think he was basically telling me that the monster was a was a sexual sadist, which is what I also concluded. I at first I had it wrong. I have to admit I, I had him take this something else. When I gave it more thought, um, the first murder scene, the first okay. The, the first murders attributed to the monster, in fact, I was just writing a chapter on this the other day, were the 1968 murders of uh, Barbara Locci and, and uh, Antonio Lobianco. I don't believe those were committed by the monster. I'm not going to get into why because it's a long discussion. But I, I believe that, that the first actual monster murders were in 1974, uh, the murders that were committed in uh, Borgo San Lorenzo. And in that murder, he... In those murders, he took the female out of the car and he, and he stabbed her three times forcefully to kill her because he didn't shoot her to death as he did with other victims later. She was still alive. So I think that he panicked, took her out of the car, stabbed her three times to get her to stop screaming to kill her. But then he used his knife to stab her another 94 times or something like that with very small pricking wounds. This is almost text. Uh, hello, Mike. You still with us? Or did so um, and then someone, um, someone say oh maybe he evolved into something else you don't evolve from one type of murder into another you're, um, you're sorry, the other. for a second we lost your audio for a second uh could you kind of go back and say the uh point um starting with um he took her out of the car and he stabbed her 96 times did you say yeah he stabbed her like a total of 97 times yeah, i think right. three four four 94 that were that were very superficial pricking wounds and he actually outlined uh the area of the of the body that he would be exercising the next time that he that he killed somebody he, he sort of gave you a clue as to what he'd be doing and this type of of uh, very superficial stabbing is called pickerism it's sort of a probing with a knife where you're trying to like it's it's like you don't know what a woman is and you want to you've never been with one before you want to see what she's made of you're you're stabbing different areas and uh, this is typical of a sexual sadist. So in my mind, the monster Florence was definitely a sexual sadist. The Zodiac Killer was a different type of killer called a power assertive, who's killing for power. Uh, the other one's an anger killer, an anger excitation killer. So one's killing for anger, one's killing for power. 
you don't evolve from one to the other. You don't evolve from a power killer to an anger killer. You're either one or the other. So to me, the notion that Zodiac went over to Italy and became the monster of Florence is, like I've said before, if that's true, then there's no need for behavioral profiling because it just totally scotches behavioral profiling because it, it totally makes a mockery of, 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 the, of the distinction that we would make between those two types of killers. Well, I also think that the monster of Florence was a sexual sadist. When you read up the ba read about the basic info of the monster of Florence, you'll read stuff like he mutilated the pubic regions of the victims, and they pay attention to that word, which I think I can only gather that means like maybe not even the genitals, but the area right above the genitals. And you talked about the picarism. Yes, it seems like um, the monster of Florence was a sexual sadist. Now about behavioral profiling, behavioral profiling has proven to be valuable. We can see this very clearly from the case of David Meyerhofer, the Montana child killer, who's the subject of the book Shadow Man, where they talk about how behavioral profiling was the biggest anyway. piece of evidence in leading to his conviction and the capture. Uh, could you could you re repeat that question? Because I sort of lost it. Oh, that was just I a lost you in the middle. That um, it wasn't exactly a question. I was just saying that I agree that the monster of Florence was a sexual sadist because. Do you have any specific info, like when it says online, the monster of Florence mutilated the pubic regions of the victims? Do you have any more detail about that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess I can share that because it's not specific. I mean, I didn't discover it, but if you read the only book in English that I know of right now, in fact, I heard that they're doing a four-part series. Someone told me the other day they're doing a four-part series on the monster of Florence. I don't know when it'll be out, but they haven't contacted me about being in it, but I just heard that they're doing it. So there's going to be something coming out in the Monster of Florence. Um, if you uh, read the book by Preston and Spetsy on on the Monster of Florence, for some reason they they totally mislead the reader as to what the monster was doing in terms of the of the mutilation. That they make it sound like he was cutting out, gouging out the the vagina and taking the vagina with him. That's the impression I had. But there are many books in Italian on the Monster of Florence. You could read them on Kindle because there's a translation function in, in Kindle. I've read three or four books in Italian, excuse me, on the Monster of Florence. I'm reading one now. And uh, what he what he was doing was he he was basically taking the pubic hair, just the pubic hair from the from the victims. Uh, and he would include the upper like the upper thighs and you know maybe go up into the you know lower abdomen. But he was basically taking the pubic hair and sparing the the uh, the labia majora for the most part. I think he may have taken one maybe by accident. I don't know. But he wasn't he wasn't actually taking the female genital parts he was taking the pubic hair just the pubic hair somebody tried to say he was a cannibal well who would want what cannibal would want to eat that i mean you know it's it's, it's disgusting to even think about mm -hmm. i mean the whole thing is disgusting but it's disgusting to think that he would take that sp specific thing from several victims to eat so uh he had another another motive i i haven't uh, have some ideas some tentative ideas about why he might have done it specifically i'm not going to get into those now uh, they'll be in my book but um yeah, so that's what he was doing. He was taking the pubic, the pubic region, the pubic hair from the female victims. Absolutely not like the Zodiac Killer at all, I agree. But do you have a title for your book yet that you are writing? Ah, oh, it seems like we've lost Michael again there. It seems like Mike is losing me for a bit and I'm losing him for a bit, but I think he'll be back in just a second. And uh, Mike, can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yeah, hold on a second. I turned off the phone because I, you froze and I think it got too hot. I mean, it feels hot, but I don't know what to do about it. Oh, there you are. Ah, yes, Mike. Has um, we'll but I was it. asking, do you have a title for your book yet? No, I don't have a title for the Monster of Florence book. I'm still writing it, so I haven't gotten to that point yet. I mean, it won't be out for a while yet. Um, I, I mean, I hope to make enough... My dream is always to make money in the Zodiac case so I can go over to Italy and actually see the crime scenes and do some research over there. So uh, for that to happen, uh, it's going to be a while. So I don't uh, I don't have any, any immediate plans to, to, to put the book out now. Uh, just curious, do you read the other books in Italian or do you read them in the English translations? No, I have to read the English translations. I mean, I've picked up some Italian, like Coletto means knife, you know, and things like that. Um, but uh, Better than me. You know, I, I I don't read in Italian. My name's Italian, but I don't read any Italian, so yeah, that's what I, was uh, I have to read in English. That's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you read, these books are accessible in uh, in English. You just have to use the translation app to read them. I guess it's a little bit tedious, but it's not too bad. 
OK, though, but right now I would like to go back to something that we talked about at the beginning of the episode, and that is the 1966 murder of Sherry Jo Bates. Sherry Jo Bates was murdered on October 30th of that year, and there were three sets of communications that were mailed after her murder. Firstly, the Riverside Confession in November. Then there's the discovery of the desktop poem, not exactly mailed. That one's not mailed, excuse me. There's the discovery of a desktop poem. Then, as Mike previously stated, in the spring of 1967, we have the three letters that are mailed that either say Bates had to die, there will be more, or she had to die, there will be more, signed with a Z. Now, you've shared a lot of things at the beginning, Mike, about how that, number one, you used to believe that Sherry Jo Bates was killed by the Zodiac. Now you do not. And you also are not convinced that those final three letters were written by the prankster or hoaxer that was identified in 2021. Um, would you like to begin with either one of those? I'd really like to discuss both of them with you, but would you like to begin with either one? Um, all right, let's talk about the hoaxer. First of all, I, because of the things I've seen over the years, I have very little confidence in RPD to tell anybody the truth. Um, they. I remember back in maybe 1999 or 2000, it was either Tom Boyd or Butterfield went to interview them, and they said that uh, that uh, Sherry Jo Bates was definitely murdered by her uh, her boyfriend, and that uh, he was playing basketball at the time, and he got a call, and someone overheard him saying that B I T C H is at the library. I mean, just very melodramatic stuff, you know. But and. Um, and it turns out that in 2001, they developed mitochondrial. When Bates was found, she was found with three, three. I think I always got the color wrong, blonde or brown. I think blonde, maybe hairs in her hand. I think it was blonde, three blonde hairs in her hand. And they developed mitochondrial DNA. I think the FBI did in 2001. They, they stopped um, their suspect, the local suspect at the airport when he came in for Christmas one year, I guess 2001. And they compared his mitochondrial DNA to hers and it didn't match. But they still say that this guy was a Zodiac. And now it comes out, I heard that RPD never was able to rule out Sherry Jo Bates as the donor of the hair in her hand, that she didn't pull her own hair out. I mean, her brother, I know, was alive. I don't know if he's alive now. Michael, I spoke to him. I know in 2001 he was alive. I don't know if he's alive now. But all they had to do was go to him and get some hair because he would have the same with the same mother. He would have the same mitochondrial DNA as Sherry Jo Bates. Um, they didn't do basic stuff. And then they lied and they told that they, they, they've deceived. So I don't know if you noticed when the press release came out, they told they told you just nothing except what they wanted to tell you. They didn't tell you anything that would be helpful, like whether there was any DNA on the on the uh, the Bates at the die letters that was compared to the to the boy. And that's what they said. Right. We got DNA from the <clears throat> Bates at the die letters. We compared it to the kids DNA and they match that that would have been one thing. But the way they put it. It's so cryptic that they were able to match his DNA to the letter he wrote. He wrote the letter anonymously. Apparent, apparently, they took DNA from the stamp or the envelope. They did uh, genetic genealogy, and they were able to go back and find this this guy who wrote the letter. So they matched him to his own letter, but they don't tell you how they matched him to the base of the die letter. And I don't think that's a coincidence because Riverside, their goal is to separate the Zodiac case from the from the uh, from the Bates case, and also to give you as little information as possible. That's that's their that's their goal. And I've tried to get the Riverside. I, I had a big thing going last year with a year ago with this guy from the Riverside Press trying to get them to write a, a probing article about the case, but asking the tough questions. The guy said that he didn't he didn't see any need to do it or something like that. So they, they wouldn't do it. So, you know, I try to get the L.A. Times interested. You know, the, the, it's not their case. Well, the, even though even though the L.A. The Zodiac wrote a letter to the L.A. Times, I couldn't get them interested either. So the only people who can keep the police honest are the press. If the press refuses to write an article where they ask tough questions, the police don't have to answer tough questions from me or from you or from anybody else. But they they're almost they're a little more obligated to answer questions from the press because the press can write an article being critical of them. And I think that that would that would spur them to answer to answer some questions. But the, so far, the Riverside Press doesn't show an appetite for writing such an article. So it sounds like you might be in line with something that Ray Grant once shared in the comment section here on Black Box Online Radio, and I'm 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 speaking on his behalf. These are my my best attempt to reiterate his words, and it was that the correct interpretation of the press release that was put out in 2021 would be that somebody confessed to writing the three letters. That was in 2016, and the authorities have made a statement that he was not the killer of Sherry Jo Bates, and he was not the Zodiac, and 
that is it that they've uh, as you just said they've identified the letter writer they looked into him and he was not the killer and that should be everything they do not actually state very clearly in their own words that he was confirmed to have been a hoaxer and there was a match between his letter and the hoax letter is that right yeah i i i haven't read that <coughs> excuse me, that press release in a while but uh, my recollection is that they were able to match him to his letter and yeah maybe the i don't i don't remember what they said about i guess they ruled him out as being well he was he was so young i guess they ruled him out as being the zodiac and i guess they also ruled him out as being the murder of sherry joe bates <laughs> But they didn't say anything that I remember to say how they linked him to the Bates had to die letters, because I think in doing so, they would have had to reveal some information about the Bates had to die letters. They didn't want to do that because then that would help the public. They don't want to help the public. They want to keep everybody in the dark as much as possible. So that's that's the issue I have with the Riverside. So until they put out something that, that shows how they linked this suspect to those letters, the Bates had to die letters, I'm going to remain skeptical of of what they said because they 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 have they're so self-serving they want you to believe that this local guy was the was the zodiac was the the bates murderer but they but dna ruled him out well how are you supposed to how are you supposed to look at that why didn't they go to michael bates initially before all this happened and get his dna to his mitochondrial <laughs> dna to make sure that it wasn't sherry joe bates own hair that were that was in her hand oh and the other thing they said <laughs> And this is even more bizarre. They said that the three hairs that ended up in Bates' hand might have blown out of the head of an investigator on the scene and landed in her hand. That's what they said at one point. Oh, I had not heard yeah. that before. Is that real? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, I remember that from years ago. You know, that these hairs magically blew out of someone's head and ran into her hand. I mean, the whole notion is ridiculous. See, the thing I mean, is that there's a guy. I, I wouldn't believe guys that if I heard it the first time. No, no, I wouldn't believe it either. Uh, one of the guys that... Here's the thing is that I don't know if they're covering up for a guy because there, there's a guy that I forgot his name now, but he was on the scene of the Bates murder and he ended up getting arrested and put in jail years later for for molesting his uh, his grand, his daughter and another friend or something like that. You know who I'm talking about? Um, I might if I hear a little more information. Yeah, the, he was. Um, he, be, he became a detective later on, I think he was at the scene of the Bates murder. So I so in other words. What I think they might be saying is that maybe the hairs blew out of his head into her hand, and maybe his DNA matched the mitochondrial DNA from her hand. But that's but the way to explain it is, well, he was on the scene, and the hair might have blown out of his head onto her hand, and that's how that's how it that's how it matched. Now, I don't I don't know if it matched or not. I'm just saying that if it did. In other words, they they could be ex trying to explain away something that they found that they don't want to believe that one of their own guys might have killed her. Uh, I forgot his name now, but. Uh, he got arrested several years ago and put in prison for sexually molesting his, I think it was his granddaughter and her friend or something like that, really young kids. That story so, sounds really familiar. I think I've heard it before too, but no, I don't remember his exact name yeah. though. But I, I did say it was the second question that I had for you. And that was, originally you said you thought that Sherry Joe Bates was a victim of the Zodiac killer, but now you had somewhat of a reversal on that. Would you like to walk us through that journey? Yeah. Um, you know, when I first started out, I didn't, didn't know anything about behavior profiling. I wasn't you know, looking at it from a profiling standpoint, but uh, the murder of Sherry Joe Bates seems to have been a very personal, very sexual crime where, you know, it was, it was up close and, and, and personal murder. And, um, you know, other than, I mean, you can try to equate it with, with, with what happened to uh, Cecilia Shepard, but um, it seems like he was stalking Sherry Joe Bates. I mean, he planned the murder of Sherry Joe Bates. Um, it's just it's just got a different feel to it. I, I forgot all the reasons now why I why I ended up ruling out that as a, as a Zodiac murder. But I think that it's more of a sexual crime. And um, I just don't view the, the the Zodiac crimes were not sexual. You know, the, even though he stabbed Cecilia Shepard 10 times, that doesn't mean it was a sexual crime. It was just, a, you know, he stabbed Brian Hartnell, too. So um, it's nothing nothing that equates with the with it being a sexual crime. But I think the Sherry Joe Bates murder was more of a sexual crime. So uh, it, it almost seems like it was someone who who knew her, who stalked her, and who uh, tried to play, you know, someone maybe she knew peripherally, not someone she knew real well, but someone who had admired her from afar. And uh, he saw an opportunity to be, to be the knight in shining armor. And I think he walked with her and eventually confessed to her how much he cared about her and how much he loved her, and she might have told him to go to hell. And then he had to kill her in order to save face. I think that's the way Richard Walter put it. So, um, 
yeah, I, I think that the surge of. And just waiting for Mike to come back. Mike, if you can hear me, you're a little bit frozen for a second. And yes, as we might wait for Mike to come back, I also don't believe that Sherry Joe Bates was killed by the Zodiac for a lot of the reasons that Mike has stated. And uh, yeah, Mike, you're back now. We lost you for a second, but no, I mean, I do agree with you that it appears to be that that could be a crime where someone has a sexual motivation, even though there's not rape or molestation, but a sexually motivated serial killer who's getting extremely physical with the victim. I mean, that's just putting two and two together in terms of understanding sexuality. But you did talk about how you've had a very long set of interactions with Richard Walter, 14 years. Now, overall, would you like to share anything about your understanding of serial killers that has uh, taken place after interacting with Richard Walter all this time. You talked about understanding sadistic killers versus uh, power assertive killers. Would you like to share any other observations about serial killers? And as I'm sitting here, I just thought of something else with, with regard to the Bates murder that I want to get into in terms Bates, of profiling. Yes. I remember Richard Walter, Richard Walter told me that he would need to see the specific files in order to come up with a definite profile. And, you know, Riverside wasn't running to Richard Walter with the files, but he felt based on what I described that um, there's another, there's another power killer who's called a uh, power reass power, wait, wait, power reassurance killer. That's someone who isn't really sure of himself. He, 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 he might be called a gentleman rapist. And I think that um, Walter felt that, that uh, the murder of Sherry Joe Bates could have been a, a a power reassurance killer, who after he was rejected by Bates became an anger anger retaliatory killer. In other words, you you retaliate in anger at the person that that rejected you. So neither one of those includes a uh, power power reassert uh, power uh, power assertive killer. So that's why I think that Richard Walter felt that that the Sherry Joe Bates murder was not a Zodiac murder because it wasn't a power. Uh, assertive murder. It was a power reass re uh, reassurance murder. It, then changing to uh, a power reassurance individual who was just looking for a date, maybe, who turned into an anger retaliatory killer when he was rejected. Yes, and um, I more or less agree with that assessment, even though I haven't been able to put it in those exact words. I've talked for a long time about how I didn't think that Bates was killed by the Zodiac killer. Still abs an absolute tragedy. Rest in peace to Sherry Jo Bates. She didn't deserve to be murdered, but I don't think that her death was Zodiac related for a lot of those reasons. Maybe that's a more articulate way of explaining it. But and let me just, just to get into that a little bit more, if you don't mind. Please. Um, the reason I think the reason I think that that Cavalli as Zodiac was interested in the Sherry Jo Bates murder and why I think he may have written the the, uh, the Bates had to die letters is that he was in Riverside that weekend. I can place him in Riverside that weekend for the for the race. So he was there. Plus, Sherry Jo Bates was killed. Uh, and the, the car that was disabled was a Volkswagen Beetle, not not one that Cavalli would have imported because he had the Northern California Beetles, but it was it was related to a car that he was associated with, just like Brian Hartnell's car was a, a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. And I think that Cavalli might have seen that Carmen Ghia and said, hey, you know, this is this is a, I'm going to ride on this car because it's a, to associate myself with it, just like I've autographed other cars in the past that are associated with me. So. Um, you know, I, I think that the, I think that's the reasons that that Cavalli would have been interested in the base case, even if he didn't kill her. The case might have intrigued him because of the fact that it involved a Volkswagen, and he was in Riverside the weekend that it, that it occurred. Okay, but do you believe that Shel Cavalli wrote the Riverside Confession in November of '66 as well? That's always been. There's always been one piece of information that I, I don't think that's ever come out. Uh, and that is the call to the police, because uh, he said that I called, I called you, or something like that. Yes, and I am. The police, the police have never, the side of never helpful has never confirmed whether there was a call or whether there wasn't a call. So they've never, they've never given any help on that to the public, which is typical for Riverside because they don't help anybody with anything except when they want to tell lies. Oh, okay. Well, yes. Um, I'm not sure if the, there actually was a call, but there is that line in the Riverside Confession. I do completely agree. And also, Mike. Um, in addition to the Zodiac Killer and the Monster of Florence, are there any other true crime cases that you have followed? Well, I've I've followed a lot of them, but not as none as seriously as Zodiac and uh, Monster of Florence. I mean, I've I've had an interest in the. Um, 
uh, John Benet Ramsey case because I view that as being a sexual sadist because she was garroted and all that. So, yes, yes. so that, that that seems like a sexual sadist. But you know who that was and how to find them that that's that's problematical. Uh, I don't know how to how to come up with an, an answer to that one. So it's difficult to write about. But the Montserrat Florence case, what I'm trying to do is is put out a profile. I don't have a specific suspect for the Monster Florence, but I'm trying to put out a profile that would allow people in Italy who lived there at the time, and somebody had to re be related to the monster or work with them or be a friend with them. And maybe if I put out enough information that says he was this, he was this, he was this, somebody will say, hey, you know, I knew somebody like that. And maybe even if he's dead, maybe we'd be able to come up with a name for who the monster was. That's that's my goal in writing the book on the Monster Florence. I'm not trying to solve that case like I did with the Zodiac case, uh, it's a completely different different beast. So, uh, but that's my goal is to, is to put out a profile that uh, actually lists some things that the Monster Florence might have been doing. There's some things I came up with that aren't that are off the beaten path that aren't things that people normally think of. So uh, that's why I think I have something new to contribute, you know, something different to contribute. Now, I don't know if you want to answer this question or not, but. Mm -hmm. There is a suspect we've already talked about in the Monster of Florence case, and his name is Giuseppe Bevilacqua, the suspect of Francesco Emiconi. Even if we exclude the Zodiac Killer connection, is Joe Giuseppe Bevilacqua a reasonable suspect for the Monster of Florence, or is that guy Francesco completely out of touch? I would. I don't know enough about uh, Bevilacqua to to be able to say that he was the Monster of Florence, but. If I had to pick between the two, I would say there's more of a chance of him being the monster of Florence. I don't think there's any chance that he was the, the Zodiac, because I think I already know who the Zodiac was. And uh, he doesn't fit the profile of a, of a wealthy, wealthy, uh, powerful person that Richard Walter put forth. In fact, I don't think the, the thing about the profile that Walter did about a wealthy, powerful person is that uh, I think that there's only one suspect that really fits, and that's Cavalli. I mean, there might have been that there was another guy that they talked about who lived at on Maple Street, I forget the name, the guy's name now, the banker, years ago. I haven't heard his name recently. But uh, you know, most of the most of the suspects fall into the category of losers or just average people, uh, the people that they've been looking for 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 all these years. As far as Joseph Bevilacqua goes, there's one one interesting aspect about him, and I don't know the answer to it. I don't know if you do or not. But um, Bevilacqua was transferred to a cemetery where he was working. And I'm wondering if he requested that transfer or whether he was just transferred there by chance by the military to happen to happen to work there. That would that would help me to answer the question of whether I think he was the monster or not. Well, when I was reading about that, I was just kind of maybe I assumed too much. I thought that was voluntary because I didn't know that um, there was even the theory that he was forcefully uh, or as you said, reassigned or transferred to that cemetery. That's the one in Italy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so I, I didn't think it was forcefully transferred. He might have just been given, you know, orders. I mean, your next your next assignment is to work in this in this uh, you know in this military cemetery. I don't know uh, if if he if he went there voluntarily. That that would make him more interesting to me as a as a suspect in the Monster of Florence case. Plus, I know he injected himself into the case where he said that he had seen um, that that one suspect. Uh, I forgot his name now. The guy that they put on trial. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, Pacciani. He had seen Pacciani down by the, uh, you know, down by the, the, uh, the murder scene, which is near the cemetery. The last murder scene, which is near the cemetery. Um, but with that, that suspect, they can only connect him to like a few of the crimes. Like he wasn't even accused of the entirety of the Monster of Florence crimes. Is that correct? The suspect you just mentioned that. Um, yeah, Pacciani. I know. I thought that I thought that he was tied to all of them, but uh, I don't know Pacciani well enough off the top of my head. I know the other crimes better than I know Pacciani because I just I just don't think he was the right guy. He was too short. I mean, it, you know, he was too short. I think to to reach the uh, in the when the when the two boys were killed, the two German boys were killed. Uh, I don't think he was tall enough to shoot through the windows. Uh, they showed that he was very short. Um, so um, I sort of rejected him. I didn't really follow the. I, I haven't gotten into the trial that that heavily to know if he was accused of all the monster crimes, but I thought he was. Um, well, when I said that, I meant like when he's on, he goes on trial, right? And mm -hmm. he's not like charged with all of them, is he? I thought it was. Oh, like, I see. Like um, 
some of the crimes. Maybe like, not. I don't know. Maybe 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 they only charged him with ones they thought they could. Maybe they only charged him with the one they thought they could associate it. No, 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 no. Because they talked about him not being. They talked about him being too short for the one, for the German one. So that was, you know, he's at least I think maybe implicated in two of them. But I don't know. I don't know how many. Off the top of my head, I don't know how many crimes he was charged with. I just know that he was convicted and then he was acquitted. Right, though, so we're definitely going to have to do a Monster of Florence episode in the future once your book is coming out, and we're going to be, uh, you know, all waiting patiently for that. I know you said you don't have an exact release date, but a lot of people here on Black Box Online Radio in the audience, as well as myself, are going to be very curious. And Mike Rodelli, do you have any final send-off for us talking about the Zodiac Killer, the Monster of Florence, or any other true crime case? Yeah, as far as, you know, the case that I'm working on the most, the, the Zodiac case, uh, I think that one of the most important things about a suspect is to determine how much of the case he explains. And Cavalli explains a lot about the case. Uh, I think a lot more than any other suspect. He explains uh, the slow manner of speaking. Uh, Cavalli was described as having a slow manner of speaking in two articles from, from 1958 and 1987. He explains the, the uh, murders at uh, Presidio Heights. He explains the way Zodiac looked. He explains the dates of the murders. Uh, he explains the rest of the geography where he had a he had a ranch up near Lake Berryessa. Uh, there was a sister city relationship with Vallejo. Um, he uh, he was an avid golfer and Zodiac killed near the golf course in, in Vallejo. So uh, I think that he explained there's more than that. I'm just giving you off the top of my head. He explains a lot about the case. And I think that when you find a suspect that explains a lot about the case, that's the guy that's most likely to be the Zodiac. And um, so I feel very strongly the thing that the thing that convinced me he was Zodiac was when I found out that June 26th date, because that's something I've been looking for for years. And all of a sudden you find out that Cavalli associated himself with Mount Diablo on June 26, 1949, and then Zodiac associated with himself on June 26 with Mount Diablo on uh, on June 26, 1970. There's the same date occurring 21 years apart. And I think that in, in, when you include all the other dates that that, that make him interesting, that's sort of like the uh, the cherry on top of the Sunday. So uh, I believe that Cavalli was a Zodiac and um, you know, you, you tried to stump me with some questions. I think I was able to answer them. And um, you know, maybe I, maybe I can't account for why Canute wasn't the Zodiac, but uh, um, I certainly think that there's a lot of information that points to Shell. So. Um, and in all fairness, that was not a widely discussed claim or theory. That's just like some guy, you know, looking at a picture in the uh, comment section and he read my correction note about how there's this photo going around online that that's Shel Cavale. It's actually his brother Canute. And this guy, you know, just, you know, had like an immediate light bulb idea. And um, that's just something that I wanted to share out. But I did see his point about facial similarities and so on. And, um, we don't even have yeah, to. Well, I mean, there's going to be similarities, sure. But uh, I don't know. The, I, never, I, never, I never went off on a tangent trying to prove that Canute was the Zodiac. You know, so uh, I, I really can't speak for that. But if someone you know, wants to do that and, and wants to present a circumstantial case that's as strong as the one against Shell, they're welcome to do it. I mean, uh, you know, but the thing is, you can't just say he looks like the sketch. Therefore, I think he was the Zodiac. Obviously, that's not going to fly. Not at all. But uh, Mike Rodelli, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good day.